COVID pandemic brought our world to a grinding halt, exposing the vulnerabilities of healthcare systems globally and highlighting the inequities in addressing healthcare challenges. Now, while the COVID-linked restrictions have lifted and life has almost returned to business as usual, many warn that pandemic preparedness has probably not received the attention and resources needed. While science and scientists came through, be it vaccines or therapeutics, the response to distribution was grossly inadequate and inequitable. The pandemic also exacerbated the mistrust in government and multilateral institutions with the call for reforms picking up pace. With geopolitical risks overtaking the pandemic panic, experts worry about a setback on the healthcare agenda. Joining me now on the Global Dialogue today is a man who has spent his career researching and deconstructing public health policy. Please welcome Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University and the former White House COVID Response Coordinator. Dr. Jha, many, many thanks for joining us here on the Global Dialogue. It's wonderful to have you uh, here on the program and in India. Thank you so much for having me, and I am delighted to be back uh, in India for the first time since the pandemic, and uh, it's just good to be back home. You know, I, I want to, before I talk about the pandemic and, and other healthcare challenges, I, I just want to address your view on India. You know, it's been quite a journey for you uh, from Bihar, which is where you were born, uh, uh, to Canada, and then to the U.S., where you now reside and where you built your career. As you come back to India, uh, in your new avatar today, what are your thoughts? How do you see the country and what it has become? Uh, this is certainly a very different country than the one I left when I was a child. And it, is, it very much feels like a country on the move. Uh, while no country was perfect in the pandemic, mm. uh, in the pandemic uh, there were a lot of innovations that came out of India. And returning now as the pandemic fades, uh, it really does feel like a much, much brighter future for health in India and for India overall. As you look back at what we've been through over the past three years, and more importantly, how prepared we are for the next pandemic, which uh, you know most health experts tell us it's a question of uh, timing and not if it's actually going to happen. Do you believe that we are better prepared today? Have we learned the lessons from the COVID pandemic? Yes, yeah, so there is no question in my mind we are better prepared. If the question is, are we as a, as a world uh, or is India or is America as a country adequately prepared? I would say no. There is more work to do. But are we better prepared than we were in 2019? Absolutely. You know, speaking of uh, the, the work that needs to be done, and I think as I pointed out at the start of the program, uh, the big challenge that the pandemic threw up uh, was the inequities in our healthcare system, uh, not just in the availability of vaccines, but when the vaccines were available, in the distribution of the vaccines as well. Uh, you know, what do you believe the approach now needs to be in being able to learn from that experience? We're talking about the mRNA vaccine and, you know, the uh, the Nobel Prize winners this year uh, on account of the, the work that they've done with the mRNA vaccines have been recognized. But is, is the world uh, and healthcare systems globally, administrations globally, looking at how we can actually make use of the science that is available to us? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. And I will say a question that doesn't get asked often enough. It is undoubtedly true. We have built these mRNA platforms. They're fantastic for COVID vaccines. They're going to give us many, many other vaccines. And that's great. But vaccines unto themselves don't do anything unless you can distribute them, unless you can get them into people's arms. And when I look at countries that have did very well on distribution, the first country I think of is the United Kingdom. Why? Because they have a fantastic national health service that was able to quickly distribute it. I actually think India did very well in distribution, but there were some challenges, as you said. And the solution there is really building out our healthcare infrastructure. You know, since we're talking about vaccines and distribution, uh, one of the other issues that got highlighted on account of the pandemic was the the raging debate, uh, or, or I would say the ongoing debate on patents and IP and healthcare costs and the access issue or the access deficit. Uh, where where do you believe the world stands on these issues today? specifically in light of the fact that multilateral institutions have lost a lot of the heft that they enjoyed. Yeah, look, pandemics have a profound impact on almost every institution. They certainly have had impacts on governments, 
on these multilateral institutions. Here's kind of my big picture thinking about these issues of IP distribution, uh, vaccine production. First of all, uh, I very much supported uh, waiving IP rights for vaccines. I think these vaccines are extraordinary. We want companies to develop them. We want companies to make money. But at the end of the day, they have to get out to the world as quickly as possible. And waiving intellectual property rights for a vaccine in the middle of a pandemic made a lot of sense to me. It's the position that President Biden took. And I think we made progress there. I think that's one issue. But IP alone doesn't solve the problem. There's also the distribution, the distribution and, and, and distribution of manufacturing. If you look at the place that built almost a very large proportion of vaccines for the world, it was the Serum Institute here in India. Incredible capability. The question is, how do we expand that capability beyond Serum? How do we create partnerships between, let's say, Serum or Pirate Biotech and manufacturers in, in Africa or in Latin America? This is the kind of work that needs to be done now so that we have distributed manufacturing so the next time there's a crisis, we're not just looking to one or two or three manufacturers, but that we have manufacturing around the world. So, so who does that? Who takes the lead in that? Do we leave it to the private sector? Do we leave it to Serum and Bharat Biotech to go out there and, uh, and, and in commercial agreements? Or, or does the government take the lead? I mean, who gets this done? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, in my view, complicated problems like this cannot be solved by any one sector alone. Government alone can't do it. Uh, non-profits or multilaterals alone can't do it, uh, and, and the private sector alone can't do it. And so you really need to bring them together. You need to create financial models that make sense for the private sector. Uh, you need to have that kind of uh, regulatory cooperation. So this is hard work. This is not going to be easy, but I think it is very doable if government leaders, if multilaterals like WHO and the African Union and others take a leadership role. And then, of course, you have to have companies like Serum or Moderna or Pfizer or others also at the table participating in the process. But do you, you know, and there's two questions that I have for you here. Do you believe uh, that given the, the many challenges that the world faces today, whether it's inflation or it's geopolitics, you know, two wars at this point in time, uh, virtually that, that leaders are dealing with, do you believe that the healthcare agenda uh, has sort of been pushed back on the list of priorities? Uh, you, you know, you were, you were part of, uh, of the White House as, as the response coordinator for COVID, so you understand the many complexities uh, that governments need to deal with. So do you fear that given what is happening in the world today, that pandemic preparedness or healthcare investments are likely to be pushed back on the list of priorities? This is a very good question, and I worry that some countries will do that. But here's the bottom line. It is incumbent of those who are in health to remind our leaders, yes, there are crises. What's happening in Ukraine, what's happening uh, in, in Gaza. Uh, obviously, there are other challenges like climate change, inflation, economic issues. Those are all important, we, and obviously they're going to have to focus on those. But health has to be part of the agenda. Health is critical to economic growth over the long run. Underinvestment in health harms economic growth. Obviously, spending is going to have to come down from COVID levels. We all understand that. But we have to continue making investments in health because the benefits are so substantial across all sectors. And I'm seeing actually quite a bit of receptivity to that. Obviously, it's not going to have the same priority it did three years ago. Mm. That makes sense. Um, but making sure it's still on the agenda, still on the list, that's a case we have to make. And I have found in the U.S., I have found elsewhere, I've been visiting with government officials here, mm. uh, I have found a lot of receptivity to that kind of argument. Well, that's good to hear. My, the second part of my question linked to what you just said, that we need to get all stakeholders to the table, including the likes of Pfizer, Moderna, Serum, Bharat Biotech, uh, to name just a few. But do you see a willingness, especially on the part of Big Pharma, let's be honest about this, to come to the table? Yeah, look, I think uh, my experience, again, at the White House was we interacted with the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they understood that in a crisis, uh, they had to be at the table, that they had to be willing to show up. Um, you know, if you think about the mRNA vaccine, so much of that was developed uh, with funding from the U.S. government. They understand that governments can play a very, very large role uh, in, in these moments. 
and that they have to be to be a part of the of the solution as well. So I have never found that if you frame the question in the right way, and if you frame the issues and remind them of the importance. I have consistently found that they are willing to come to So how would you frame the question today? Uh, you know, if you were to bring all stakeholders to the table and you were to pitch this to the likes of Pfizer and Moderna, how would you frame the question to get them on board? Yeah, so I would have to say, look, uh, the, the crisis of COVID may be receding, but there are other important health crises facing the world and distributed manufacturing, making sure manufacturing of vaccines and treatments are happening around the world is a critical priority. And so we need companies, uh, you know, many companies that have actually gotten substantial amount of resources from governments to, to at this point step up, uh, be involved in technology transfer, be involved in, in know-how transfer, build uh, these manufacturing plants in places that don't have them. Uh, obviously, India is in a place where we actually have a lot of capacity inside, the, uh, inside India. Uh, I think the, the major product producers like Serum and Pilot Biotech have to be part of that same conversation. I think we have to remind these companies that if they walk away now, in the next crisis, they will need government support. They will need government help. They will need government funding. This is a long-term partnership. It's very important that they play a role right now. Well, uh, I, you know, I, you make an important point, but the question is whether we're going to see this messaging uh, from governments to the private healthcare sector and to private pharmaceutical companies uh, being made as clearly as you just framed it. We are going to take a quick break here on the Global Dialogue and return uh, to our conversation with Dr. Ashish Jha in just a moment. Stay with us. We're back in a second. Welcome back. You're watching the Global Dialogue and we're in conversation with the former COVID response coordinator at the White House, Dr. Ashish Chah. But, uh, you know, one of the other things that I want to talk to you about uh, outside of, uh, of uh, COVID is, is, the, is the manner in which institutions responded. Uh, and I know that you're also a believer in the fact that uh, there needs to be a lot more input from different sources so that you can put uh, all of that in play as far as policymaking is concerned. Uh, you also believe that it is very important to follow process and the need for transparency to really explain why decisions have been made uh, and to own up and course correct uh, if those decisions haven't worked out. You know, in your experience as uh, the White House COVID response coordinator, what have been the big lessons on that front? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. You know, look, um, we always want to have science and evidence at the heart of policymaking, but the truth is that these are complicated countries. I think about India, I think of Amer about America, large, sprawling democracies with many voices, many interests, and policymakers, and I've experienced this certainly at the White House, need to get input from many sectors, not just the health sector, not just from doctors and, and epidemiologists and public health experts. Those are very important, but you also have to think about the impact of policies on workers, on schools, on uh, you know, just sort of society at large. And if you're going to make policy, you've got to bring everyone along. So when I was on the outside, it often seemed very easy to say, oh, the government should just do this or the government should do that. Inside, you can to begin to realize maybe that's still the right answer, but you have to bring a lot of people along. Uh, because in a democracy, it's not, you can't just dictate what you think is the right answer. You really have to listen to people. And then you have to come up with a policy that a broad swath of people can live with. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I would imagine that that will perhaps guide the way that we deal with, with future pandemics. I hope we don't have to, but, uh, but hopefully that will guide the way that we deal with them. But I want to, you know, you're here in Delhi, uh, and perhaps one of the things that doesn't get enough attention uh, as much as it should uh, is the is the healthcare burden, the healthcare impact on account of climate change, on account of pollution? Uh, and are, are these things that are being taken seriously at a global level? And what do you believe the adequate, appropriate response needs to be? Yeah, so this is a fantastic question. Here, here's my view on this. Climate change probably represents the single biggest health threat facing humanity in the years and decades to come. It will change every aspect of health. Um, I don't think that the global health community and I don't think the global community is taking climate change seriously enough. 
as a health threat. Of course, we're talking about climate change in terms of temperatures and sea levels and all of those. They are important. For me, climate change is going to be seen and felt by most people through health. That's why I often say health is the human face of climate change. Now, what does that actually mean in terms of what should be done? Obviously, we have to work on the underlying causes, carbon pollution, reducing our dependence on, uh, dependence on carbon and carbon fuels. But the healthcare system has to start, and the public health system has to start thinking about how does it change delivery? How does it manage the fact that we're seeing more heat waves, more pollution? The combination of pollution and heat waves means more asthma, strokes, heart attacks, new diseases. There's a lot of important work that has to be done in the health and public health system that just isn't as far along as it needs to be, largely because I just don't think people have taken climate as a health threat enough. Mm. Uh, that has to change. Uh, are you seeing the approach change to that? And what worries you the most? You talked about you know, the risk of uh, respiratory uh, linked diseases going up on account of climate change, pollution and so on and so forth. The risk of new diseases as well. Uh, what are you seeing at this point in time? What's visible? What does the data tell us already? Yeah, the thing that data tells us is climate change as a health threat is not something far in the future. It is happening now. Uh, we are seeing, whether it's in India or in the U.S. or elsewhere, uh, we are seeing very different weather patterns. We're seeing more, uh, you know, in the U.S. we had wildfires that caused uh, terrible air quality for days and weeks. That has an effect. Of course, we're seeing from climate change drought that's leading to my mass migration of people. Um, so these threats that we used to think would be 10 or 20 years down the road, they are here today. And we have got to start working on solving those problems and adapting our systems to climate change today. This is not an agenda of something we need to do a decade from now. We've got to get going. You know, talking about problems that need fixing, let's address uh, the problem of medical debt. And that's a problem that is particularly uh, prevalent in the U.S. But I also want to understand from your point of view what you make of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of foray of private equity into healthcare. Here in India, you now have virtually every large major healthcare service provider with majority ownership that is with private equity. Uh, and I don't know whether we fully understand the implications of that. You know, on both these fronts, your views. Yeah. Um, so medical debt to me is a moral stain. I mean, it, must, it really is a moral stain. I mean, if you think about it, you should not have to go into debt if you get sick. This is a problem in the U.S., about $200 billion of medical debt, uh, including among many people who have health insurance. That's largely driven in the U.S. by the extraordinarily high cost of health care, and even a lot of insurance people have to pay extraordinary amounts of money uh, out of pocket. Obviously, we've seen medical debt here in India as well. I, I think there are some policy solutions that are very important. I have been very publicly for years a very vocal supporter of Ayushman Bharat. I think that is a very important step forward in providing financial protection to uh, poor people of India. I've been a very vocal supporter of expanding Medicaid and doing other things to ensure more and more Americans. Same principle. We've got to get people insured and covered. That's not enough. And then when you see private equity, your second part of your question, to me, that is a symptom. It says you have a health system uh, that is not functioning in a way that is really optimal and that private equity can go in. Now, sometimes we have seen examples of private equity firms go in and actually clean up a mess, make a health system better. That happens. Unfortunately, those are rare. Uh, a lot of times what we have seen is private equity firms go in, uh, really uh, take all the value out of that health system, leave it with large amounts of debt, and leave patients really much off, worse off in those communities. So that is something I think government needs to look at very carefully and, and really make sure that when you have those kinds of private equity investments, that ultimately they are leading to good for the health of the population that it serves and not just benefiting the uh, private equity uh, investors who want to make a quick buck and get out. Mm. So, you know, what would you suggest uh, be the guardrails then? Because, you know, these are private market transactions. These are uh, many publicly listed companies. So the government involvement uh, is limited. Uh, so what do you believe the government can do by way of placing any guardrails in place? 
Yeah, look, I'm a, I believe in markets. I believe in, you know, in, in free markets. But when it comes to healthcare and actually other areas as well, um, there is absolutely a role for government, certainly on regulation, on making sure uh, that quality is high in these places, making sure that there's financial transparency. Uh, I believe that more and more of these private systems should also have as part of their mission serving the poor, making sure that they're taking care of some proportion of people who have, uh, let's say, uh, public insurance or through Ayushman Bharat or others, uh, that all of those things can be safeguards. Um, you know, one of the ways that we manage a lot of these issues in the United States is through really rigorous accreditation of health systems. Um, Medicare demands that hospitals and healthcare systems be accredited. Uh, that, I think, can be a very important tool. So there's a series of tools that government has uh, to make sure that these systems are delivering for people while still being part of a market system where they can make money and they can grow and they can do all the things we want private sector to do, but to do it in a way that still is responsible to the citizens that it serves. Uh, you know, uh, an issue that I wanted to get your views on, and this is something that, uh, uh, that I would like to, to learn more about, is President Biden establishing the first ever White House initiative on women's health research. And, you know, we, we run a, a massive campaign here called Future Female Forward, which basically focuses on gender parity, and I don't believe that we've had parity even in the healthcare space as far as addressing the issue of women's health. So how do you look at this and what do you believe the outcome should be? Yeah, I, I was very excited to see uh, this announcement. Uh, I think it happened uh, just very recently. A and here's why it's important. Um, if you look at the research that is done, um, a lot of women's health issues are under-focused or just they don't get enough attention, they don't get enough resources. Uh, that, I think, is obviously a huge problem. And then when you look at a lot of research studies that are done that address health issues from both men and women, we often don't have enough women as, as participants in those research. And so the results may not, it may not be as clear what the impact of that result is for women. Um, this council, uh, I think, is designed to make sure that the investments we're making in the research infrastructure, that the investments we're making to improve care are benefiting both men and women. Uh, obviously, women are half our population and incredibly important that they get the benefits of science and innovation every bit as much as men do. Uh, what, what excites you today in terms of the work that's going on, whether we talk about cancer, we talked about some of the R&D that's being done dealing with uh, women in specific, uh, or what's, what's happening with the vaccines and mRNA, uh, what do you uh, feel most confident about in terms of breakthroughs, and what are you most concerned about today? Yeah, uh, they're in some ways related. Um, what I'm most excited about is we are entering a whole new era of biology, medicine, and health. And that era is really driven by computing. It's interesting. Um, what we are understanding is computing has gotten more and more powerful. We're able to begin to solve more and more medical health and biology problems. And this, by the way, is one of the places where India has a particular advantage because of its very strong computing infrastructure, computing uh, in intellectual capability, obviously the infrastructure it has. So that, that mergence of computing and biology, uh, I think will give rise, I mean the mRNA vaccine is just one example of that, will give, us, give rise to lots and lots of things. Two concerns. One is I think many countries, I think U.S. is part of this, I think India is very much part of this, not investing enough. Uh, in investment, in R&D, in research. That is a place that is about future growth, and I want to see greater investments there. And then the second part of concern, always important, is when you get innovations, you want to make sure that as broad a swath of the population benefits. So if we develop wonderful new treatments, but half the population or two-thirds of the population doesn't benefit from it, that is really unacceptable. So making sure we're focused on that equity angle so that everybody benefits from these miracles of science, that's going to be really important. You know, since you're talking about the miracles of science, let's also talk about the miracles of AI because that's what uh, the world is focused on today. And in this convergence of computing and medicine, uh, you know, what do you believe the future holds? Uh, and, and do you believe that it can meaningfully address the access in the inequity issue? 
Yeah. So AI is like any other tool. It is unto itself not going to be magic, but it is a very powerful tool. A, a friend of mine recently described it uh, as powerful as electricity. Uh, electricity didn't solve all of our problems, but boy, it gave us new tools and new ability to, to take on very big challenges. I think AI is going to be like that. It is going to be now up to us. AI is going to end up being in everything, in every part of our lives. It is up to us to make sure that we're using AI to improve the quality of care that doctors provide. If you think about large parts of the country, uh, people who are have a- trouble accessing highly trained providers, let's think about the providers that they do access, whether it's the ASHA, uh, other community workers, the people in the, in the primary health centers. How do we augment their ability using AI? How do we make them much, much better in diagnosis and offering treatment? AI has a lot of potential. It's not magic. It will use, that potential will have impact on people's lives if we use it correctly. So I'm very excited about AI, but I'm also very sober that it's only going to make a difference in people's lives if we design systems with that in mind. Well, uh, Dr. Jha, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Global Dialogue. We look forward to having you back in India. Uh, And thanks very much for sharing your views on a whole host of issues. Appreciate your time.